chapter number 14. If you can just kind of grasp a moment. Whew. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for never stop pouring out. Uh, you just keep on going. You never stop. Thank you. What a joy already as we've been just singing praises and Lana sharing and of course the opportunity we have to draw near to him. What a joy when we draw near, he's there. <laughs> Sometimes we draw near to things and they're completely empty and disappointment when you dry, draw closer to him, draw nearer, oh my. We have lots to be thankful for this weekend, so uh, at the expense of embarrassment, but not, Angela, stand up. We want to thank you again as a church for you being here. I know that uh, you thank the Lord and we in agreement, amen, but thank you, as I said earlier, thank you for adding to us and... Uh, May we just continue in the benefic be in the beneficiaries of those that God uses by his spirit and by his word to come and bring, bring something that is more of the Lord and less of them and more for us to be better. You think of even uh, Pastor George Gray showing up in October and since then you have had a neat special time of people that have come open to what God would do through them to preach and to teach, to minister, to love, to care for you, to have compassion and show you that the love of Christ is real. And uh, that's what our series is about in 1 Corinthians. As I wrestled with our title or whatever we would do in a book study, this just kept on coming back when we started last summer, late, late summer. Was it, I, no, maybe we started in 2021. I don't know. We started a long time ago. But we're getting closer on chapter 14, and we're going to be finished soon. And we're in the home stretch. What do I mean more deeply in that Paul loved this church so much, so much, that in the midst of their worst times, he continued to add to them. He continued to give to them. He continued to bless them. He continued to tell them, even in his second letter, you want some beautiful words. You read his second letter to the church at Corinth and how he labored and labored in love over them for them to just get it, <laughs> just to get it, to get the, the truth of Jesus being everything they needed and for them to know that they could walk it out and, and God by his incredible sanctifying process could make them what he wanted them to be as a church and individually and that's that's the beauty of today. We, Real quick, I mean, <laughs> that is a prophecy. You know why? Because it's the word of God. Someone comes to Jesus Christ, and they say they want to be baptized. So I know I made light of that, but young man, it's a neat thought that I know that my mom and dad have taught me that if I get saved, I get baptized. That's scripture. And that's what we'll learn today and what it means to have the gift of prophecy, to take the word of God and tell people What's to come by the word and what the word of God says, and, and that's the beauty of it. You see, in studying the word of God together, we get so much. And I know all of you ladies got so much this weekend in worship and in prayer and, and everything that uh, it means to draw closer and have communion with the one that gave his life for you and for me. And I'm so thankful, has so many, have heard so many reports already and just a few hours of how things went, so I'm so thankful. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, if you go there, I'm going to run out some slides real quick, but I just want to highlight a couple things for you. Chapter number 14, the verse, first verse says, follow after char charity and desire spiritual gifts. There's that charity thing again. Go over to chapter 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity. There's that charity thing again. The last verse of chapter number 13, verse number 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these 
is charity. You know that this is a spirit-led letter, and you know that there's a man behind that. And he's writing things, and there's such a common commonality here. He wants us, which means the Holy Spirit wants us to know what a more excellent way is. You see, chapter 12, the context is the purpose of gifts. Chapter 14 is the perversion of gifts. Right in the middle of that is chapter 13. And Paul is directed to pen this scripture on charity and remind us that it is a more excellent way. Remember, I put that up there a couple weeks ago. I said also in chapter 2, and just this highlight again, the purpose of the gifts, bam. So it's right up there. In chapter 14, we see the perversion of the gifts. And so it's in big, bold letters for people like me who can't read unless it's big font. And then the next slide says, again, in chapter 13, we see the personality. The personality of the gifts. And so last time we spoke on this, two weeks ago, and thank you, God, for Brian Calloway. Thank you for bringing a great message. Uh, we have overcome. I listened to it twice. I loved it. And I'm thinking that was a great, great message of the Lord. And so I'm thankful. Two weeks ago we talked about personality. I said, we have a good personality. We have a great personality. Because the personality we have as a church is the Lord Jesus Christ and his love. But the greatest of these is charity. A church that faithfully uses its gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. You've seen this one. is characterized by fellowship. We like to have fellowship. Worship, we like to get together and corporately praise God, but worship is not confined to a corporate gathering. In fact, in the Word of God, it's sacrifice and obedience that really bring true worship. See, a church that sees that and understands that, the overflow is evangelism. The overflow is love and obedience, and there's this submission constantly I'm a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. So when I come to verses like this, I go, yeah, follow after charity. If I don't have charity, I have nothing. The greatest of these is charity. And I know that this is the most excellent way. It is the truth of the statement that I've said many a time with that little slide is this. My love is going to fail. My supply of love runs out. I do as good as I can. But I don't do very good most of the time. And I need God to pour in more of his love so that his love comes out. Because his love looks different than my love. A lot of times my love is conditional. I'll do if you do. A lot of times my love is predicated on someone else's actions and how their behavior is. And so I won't give them love. But when God says that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He meant it. And he gave him. He gave his son. If there's anyone that understands your suffering and your pain over loss, it's the God of the universe suffering over the loss of his son for your righteousness. If you're lost today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, I'm just telling you, there's a God that waits for you, that you come to him with a broken and contrite spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Thou will not despise. And you say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know you said your son, he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto you, Father, but by him. I'm calling on Jesus to save me today. Please, I believe in him and not in myself anymore. That's, at the end of you, is the beginning of him. And I pray that if you're lost today, you realize that the greatest loss you can have in your life is to lose you. And get the identity of Jesus Christ in your life. And then you'll understand that his love never fails. But our love constantly fails. And that's why when I look at all this and I think of what's happened to the church of Corinth, I'm thinking it could happen to any of us. It could happen to any church. We just get things mixed up. We pervert things. We get things twisted. We all worship man instead of Jesus. We, we put God the Father off in the corner and we go find out some other father figure. He's an incredible father, by the way. And I know that you'd find that out if you just believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For you that are believers today, oh my. For you that get baptized today, you said, hey, I just want to follow Jesus, my life now. I'm born again, I'm saved. Oh, I can't tell you. What a joy. Just follow and love him. He'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. Never. So here comes this idea here. In chapter 14, I'm going to walk this out again. If I only have to preach five verses, you figure I'll probably be done quickly, right? <laughs> we'll give it. We got. We'll give it a shot. There must have been a problem here. 
with prophesying in tongues for Paul to spend 40 verses addressing the topic. Now, there's a lot of important topics in the Bible that are written about and talked about a lot. And this one's not much. A little bit of the book of Acts, a little bit of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, and, and there's some other places in the gospel, but, gospels. But, but it says, it is not promoting tongues or encouraging people to speak with tongues. There is so much to be said over this subject. And I would say that there's biblical debates constantly. There's religious debates constantly. We debate over baptism, where it fits. We debate on eternal security. We, 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 we debate on spiritual gifts and apostolic gifts and election and predestinate. We, we argue over a lot of stuff here. And this is one of them. We, again, we have to look at the Word of God and see what it says. So let me just put this up on there. There are always three essential, essential principles that must be in practice when the church body gathers. There's others, but these three, I believe, are really essential. And by the way, this is from reading different commentaries, reading different notes, and I'm going, this keeps on coming up. Edifying. Edification. There has to be this principle in the church family. Understanding. It doesn't do, do, any, good, it doesn't do you any good as a believer in Jesus to kind of go after things but not understand what God's doing. You need somebody to show you. Need somebody to teach you. My prayer is that God would do that through our time together like this. Maybe even just an understanding about baptism, just by hearing a few people talk about it. Sometimes you just get more understanding. The last one's order. Look at your, your uh, passage, chapter 14. Real quick. It says up on the screen, two of these principles are in these two verses. Verse 26, look. How is it then, brethren... He's talking to born-again believers in the church. When ye come together, every one of you has a psalm. Everybody has a psalm. Everybody has a doctrine. <laughs> it says everybody has a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interruption. Whoa. <laughs> that would be awful. But it's happening here in this church. Let all things be done unto edifying. What is he saying? Does everybody that has something from God just speak all at once to cause confusion? Does someone stand up and say, I know more than you, I am better than you? No, no, no. Everyone, he's saying, has a psalm. Everyone has a doctrine. Well, let's do it with order and edification. If you're going to proclaim that God has done something, if you're going to speak a word from the word of God, if you're going to be led to do something in praise, you're going to be up here singing praises to God, then let's do it right. It has to be edifying to the body of Christ. Well, look at the other verse, verse number 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Sometimes people grab that verse out and they say, well, you need to get your house in order, so there's your Bible verse. Well, in the context of it, he's talking about the spirit gifts. He's talking about women and what their place is in church and how that should go out. He's talking about what the gifts mean and how they're used by God. He's saying let's do things decently and in order. There's principles that have to be followed. Thus, and again, all of you that hear me speak often i'm not very smart so here's a simple title principle not perversion so that's what we're going to do for the next few minutes now i'm going to do this message a little bit different i'm just i'm going to teach it through five verses and i just have just some short little clips just short, short quips of of just things i see that are principles not perversion and we'll look at a verse or two and and we're just going to teach it through this morning and not really just, you know, go after some incredible preaching thing other than always let the Spirit of God show you things and teach you things through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. So let's read this passage of Scripture in chapter number 14, just five verses, principle, not perversion. Again, I read this one earlier. Let's read it again. Follow after charity. And desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Interesting. Paul's just basically saying some straightforward stuff. If someone's speaking in an unknown tongue... They're not speaking to another person because they can't understand. They must be speaking only to God. But what edification for the body of Christ does it do? It doesn't profit, as it says, edifying. 
That's a, one of our principles that Scripture talks about constantly. Where's the edification? Verse number three. But he that prophesieth seeketh unto men to edification. Excuse me, speaketh unto men to edification. So if somebody prophesieth, they speak unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. That's neat to hear. Someone that's going to tell of something to come of the Lord. Someone that's going to take over the Bible and teach you something. That's going to give you comfort. It's going to give you an exhortation or a challenge. It's going to give you and I some building up, some edification. I like that. For someone to prophesy from the Bible here is something that has been done. Paul is saying that should be done for that reason. Verse number four. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Okay. So, again, the title of the message is Principle, Not Perversion. You saw some of the principles there, mainly edification and understanding. So let's just, I'm just, again, I'm going to teach through this here in about two minutes. Let me just give you just a simple opening. Prophesying. Let me reiterate. If someone has that gift, beyond the gift of just simply teaching, it's the ability to open the word of God and tell you, thus saith the Lord. To tell you, this is what God said. And some, you can tell, have the gift of prophesying because they can break things in the word of God and you go, wow. And they have an insight, not, you know, the extra golden nugget at the end of a trail somewhere. Maybe it's just that they have an insight. And you can tell they have a gift of prophecy. They open up the Bible. They can see what's going on. Now, I'm not talking about, again, Someone that says, I know when Jesus is coming back, they're going against the word of God. So that's not prophecy. But when we open up the Bible and someone says, hey, this is what the Lord says, and they're able to give you insight, that's the spirit of God prophesying. What does it mean for tongues? You can look up and do a deep dive. A lot of verses on tongue or tongues or languages. Lots of verses. Throughout the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, I can hardly find, and I've landed here where I can't find it to be anything other than another language. That someone has the capability of speaking another language that God gave them supernaturally for one reason. To get the gospel of Jesus Christ into someone who can get saved. Would you not agree that's what the Bible says? Someone has a language, they're able to take it, not for themselves and their own benefit, but for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be preached. If someone's taking a tongue and they can speak something and it's around people and there's nobody to interpret that, it is gibberish. It is against God's edification principle that he wants for the word of God. Simple. Simple. What good is it for somebody to have something that's supposed to be for the glory of God and they give it to themselves? We do this way too much for a lot of things. Don't just relegate it here now. Just think and search your soul of the things that God's given us for his glory. And I take them and I use them for myself. It's one of my worst things. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my life. Oh, my. That's an old hymn. So this principle, not perversion. Again, I'm just going to teach through this, like I said, rather quickly. I have a few of them, but they won't be long. Each one of them explains themselves very simply because they're from the Word of God. So we're just going to use the Bible. Principle number one. Principle not perversion. Jesus prophesied new tongues would be given to preach the gospel. Jesus prophesied it. Really? Mark chapter number 16. Let's go there. We're going to look at just about every passage that we can find this tongues stated in the Bible. No, we're not going to be here till noon. We're going to walk it through rather quickly. Watch this now. Mark 16. Mark 16. In the gospel, uh, Jesus Christ is given the great commission, correct? 
And in Mark's gospel, he's saying some things here. At the end with the guys, you know, the disciples. He says, pick it up in verse number 14. I'm just going to read through. I'll stop at 17. Here we go. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Fine. Verse 15, famous verse. Here's the great commission. Go ye into the whole world. Go into the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. How in the world could you go into the world and preach the gospel unless you had all the languages? So here's verse 16. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, but he that is believeth not shall be damned. He's saying, hey, you get saved, you're baptized, you make his testimony, and then you walk with the Lord. And then verse 17 says what? Jesus saying this. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Woo! Is everybody speak Hebrew back then? What did those guys speak? Hebrew? Not a little bit of Yiddish maybe? Jesus is already foretelling and prophesying that other people, I mean disciples after salvation will get a gift to be able to give the gospel to people all over the world because he gave them a command. He gave them a commission. He didn't say I was not going to give you the equipment to do it. He's going to give you the spiritual gifts to carry it out. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not every preacher. <laughs> what are we going to do, Lord? This agrees with 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Go back there real quick, and then we'll go to the next one, because we'll need it off of chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 22, what does it say? It says, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Aha, you thought I was making that up. It's in the Bible. It says that what? The tongues are for somebody. They're for somebody that believes not. But what does it say for prophesying? It says prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. A person that's lost can't do anything with prophecy. What good are they going to do when they haven't even got into the starting blocks yet with their walk with Jesus Christ? So the sign, gift of being able to speak a language to give the gospel enters a person into that place when they believe to now say, okay, teach me about Jesus. Teach me about the word of God. Second principle, not perversion. The day of Pentecost manifested this gift so people could hear the gospel. Right? Those of you that know, you know what happened. Go to Acts 2 real quick. Simple, Acts 2. You know this one. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 1. You know the setting. There's 120 people in the upper room. There are all these people that are followers, disciples of Jesus. There's the day of Pentecost. He's promised them in verse number 8 of chapter 1 that you're going to receive power. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to go do it all. You're going to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost. You're going to need some equipment. So in chapter 2, verse 1, Day of Pentecost came, right? It just came. Beautiful, it's there. Suddenly we know there's a sound from heaven, a mighty rushing wind woo, filled the place. Verse 3, appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. We know what happens in the next few verses. Short summation, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation. They started out maybe as people that only spoke, spoke Hebrew, but then they moved to other nations because God has scattered them, remember? They were all amazed, it says in verse number 7, the uh, verse 6, that men heard them speak in their own language, and what happened? They were kind of laughed at. <laughs> Some said that they were drunk with wine. Some that they would say they were crazy. But what does it say in verse number 9? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and all the parts of Libya around Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, they all heard the gospel. Is this not a powerful, powerful place? It very simply says this, the day of Pentecost. It manifested this gift so people could hear the gospel and be saved. The gospel in languages was understood. 
the Grecian or the Greeks were the Parthians. Simple. People that were in Iran, they would probably line up with the Medes, the Iraqis, with the Mesopotamia, and on and on it goes. These are lands and people that are real people. Generationally, 2,000 years later, they're still hearing the gospel in their own language if we could just get it to them. Number three, principle, not perversion. Number three, the Holy Spirit of God manifested the gifts in various ways during the Old Testament, New Testament transition. Now, here's a toughie, but we, we've got to look at it because it's in the Bible. We're not going to go away from it. Acts chapter number 19, so not far away. Acts 19, I believe that Brian was using the old church at Ephesus on last Sunday, so familiarity. What's going on? Very simply this. As Paul's going into this city, this big Grecian crazy city, they, many of them, as it says here, were disciples of John the Baptist. They heard about Jesus, and John, they followed after John, they got baptized after John. John preached repentance and righteousness and get your act together. That's not in the Bible, but I think getting your act together is pretty good. Now they're waiting for Christ. they got to wait for the Christ, Jesus, because he's saying, hey, he's even better. So the Holy Spirit manifested the gifts in various ways during the, and this, don't forget, the book of Acts is a transition book, so there's a lot of Old Testament stuff, transition to the New Testament, where it's going to be Jesus and Jesus alone, because it's always been Jesus alone. They just, the Old Covenant, they didn't see it enough, and they should have seen it enough, because Jesus was paramount everywhere. The Messiah was everywhere, and everything that they said, and everything they did. But yet they missed it, the Jews. So here's this transitional place. Here we are, Acts chapter number 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. He found certain disciples. Who are they? They received the Holy Ghost since you believe. He asked them a question. Have you received the Holy Ghost? So he said, wait a minute, is this the way it's supposed to be? No, remember, this is early church days. There's a transitional period of time. He's speaking to the people of the time. Verse 3, and he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? <laughs> because it said back there, and they said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? Well, then what were you baptized to? Who were you baptized to? It was John's baptism. Verse 4, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus because they were believers in Jesus. Now they're baptized. What happens in order to get the Holy Ghost this time? Look at verse number six. It's up on the screen. It says that Paul laid hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them. And now they could speak tongues. They could speak the languages that they needed to speak to the people in this multi metropolitan, multicultural Ephesus where people needed to hear about Jesus Christ. And they were able to prophesy to, which is to tell things about God. From the letters, from the word, from the gospels. Simple. That's what the Bible says. Only after Paul laid hands on them. You say, how does that apply today? Real simple. Is Paul the apostle still around? Are the apostolic gifts that are laid, to get, laid together with that man and all the other apostles? You say, well, when did it all transition? If you read the Acts of the Apostles, a lot of things go on by the time you get to chapter 28. And what you find out is the ability that they had in the spirit to do certain gifts, they didn't have them anymore, but they had other gifts. We're doing quite well. If we could just fulfill getting the gospel to everybody with the gifts that we have, I think we'd do okay. Do What more do we need? You have the greatest gift beyond Jesus and the Holy Spirit, believer, you've got the word of God. Every single thing you need. It's all right here. There's nothing else you need. So you go after this, and you go after this, and you go after some more, and then you go after some more, and then you go after some more, and you go, gosh, I don't need to have Paul lay hands on me. I already got the Holy Spirit of God when I got saved. Jesus was the baptizer, I told you. He baptized you into his death, raised you in the likeness. That's where we get the statement there, kids. It's in Romans chapter 6. You can show your parents, and you can quiz them later, okay? That's where you get that. Buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, Romans chapter number 6. And the baptizer, Jesus baptized you when you got saved. And you're new, and you felt different, and all of a sudden... Well, I got to get in the water baptism? Yeah, that's a picture. Brian, it was beautiful with the ring. I love that. Can I use that sometime? Thank you. You're very kind. But now what happened? The Holy Spirit of God was put in you after the baptizer baptized you into him. Okay. Number four. 
How many do you have? I have 17 of them. No, no, hang in there. Bobby, I have seven. Anyways. <laughs> I'll move fast. We've got a little bit of time. Here we go. Number four. Principle, not perversion. Number four. Now, here's a good one. Because this is real and you deal with it. How do you answer somebody who talks about a prayer language they have? The Bible teaches you. It says there, simple statement, prayer language is falsely taught. Because the Holy Spirit's groanings are not spoken. How do I know? In the Bible, Romans chapter number 8. When he groans, he doesn't speak. We've got to watch out for what we're saying in our prayer stuff. Because he's saying, I'll give you groanings, and he's going to do it according to the word of God and the will of God. So if he's going to speak anything, he's going to speak God's will and God's word. Ah, I'm not that complicated. And I can't be because I don't have the brain power for it. But the word of God, it's not that complicated. I just read it and I go, oh, that's what it says? Well, let's go with it. Stop trying to find extra theology to go with things. I was taught so many things over so many years that I had to unteach or unlearn. Oh, gosh, forgive me. It's what the Bible says in Romans 6. Excuse me, Romans 8. Forgive me, Romans 8. I had Romans 6 on my brain. Romans 8, verse number 26. It's an incredible chapter. I mean, chapter 6, 7, 8, you can take those, put them in your back pocket, read them every day for the rest of your life, and you'll have everything you need. Here you go. Verse number 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. I've been there a lot in my life. A lot. But it's okay to be there because of the rest of the verse. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. It's not the same intercession as Jesus. Come on now. He's the mediator. But this is intercession for us. Oh, are we spoiled in Jesus. He makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Just reading the Bible. I'm just reading the Bible. Look at the next verse if you want to just read the Bible correctly one more time. Verse 27 is beautiful. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Oh, to know the mind of the Spirit. Well, it's in you and me. It's in the Word of God. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to his fun and frolic. It's the will of God. It's so beautiful. The Holy Spirit's never going to tell you something against God's will. And is God's will against God's word? Nope. So he's going to tell you things and make groanings for us and intercession to us according to God's will. What do I do with my life? What do I do with my future? What do I do? How do I pray? What do I do? I mean, spending 15 minutes with God is good, but spending 15 more and 15 more and 15 more and 15 more, it's even gooder and gooder. Because then you're going to go, wow, he said something to me. His word said something when he groaned it in you. And you go, I never saw that before. Thank you, God. And you go share that with somebody, and somebody goes, that's so awesome. He's shown me the same stuff. Let's pray through it. I think that would be good. That's what he does. That's the Holy Spirit. You see, as I said, prayer language is falsely taught. Well, I got the Holy Spirit groaning in me. Well, that's not a prayer language. It's an intercession for us according to the words of God that he says there'll be groanings which we cannot, cannot be uttered so they can't be verbalized. But they're going to be something that go back to the word of God and the will of God. It's awesome. Number five, covet the best Holy Spirit gifts, but do not neglect the more excellent way. I came back to it. We'll finish up with chapter 12, 13, and 14 now and come full circle. We went out the front door. We're walking around the neighborhood getting a good exercise. That's for all of you. I don't do this much. But when you go out your door, you walk around a little bit. When you do, you return back to your house. So we're going to return back to our house. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses number 29, 30, and 31. I love the sarcasm. That's why I picked it. 
God led me here. I read it a couple times. I went, that's the one you want me to use? I'll use it. God, sarcasm. Paul's, Paul's very sarcastic in many ways. And I'm from New Hampshire, so I love sarcasm. I don't think you have to be in any special place from anywhere. You can just, yeah, sarcasm's fun. Just don't become cynical. Are all apostles in the church? Are all prophets in the church? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Does everybody have all of this stuff? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Of course not. Another hypothetical statement like he does in chapter 13. He says, hey, I show you. Listen, show I unto you a more excellent way. We can't say it enough. Doing things with excellent doesn't mean that you put every T and every I in a place that has to be, which is important. The more excellent way is charity never faileth. Charity never faileth. It says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and we got those two verses up there, but covet earnestly. So when I put that there, I said covet the best Holy Spirit gifts, prophecy, I like to be able to prophesy. Tongues, I'd love to learn another language. God, would you give me the miracle of knowing another language? I barely can do the English one. Barely can do it. That didn't even come out right. Yeah. I don't speak Texas. But I've been around it an awful long time. You can tell a Texan. What a crowd. You've got to play to the crowd. I don't know if this is a Holy Spirit moment or not. I'm just wondering right now. Number six. Principle, not perversion. Is there such a thing as angelic language? Hmm. I do really think this is a sarcastic statement. Angelic language is not found in Scripture when they encounter man. Verse number one, chapter 13. Look at it. Well, that's where they get it from. Chapter 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. That means that he must mean that. we got to have an angelic voice. Whoa. What angelic language did the angel who appeared to Elizabeth and Mary and John speak? I bet you he just spoke to them in their tongue. How did they understand? It's in the Bible that they heard him. How about Abraham? Who spoke to Abraham? An angel. What language did they speak? It was an angelic angel. No, it wasn't. It was their language. Hagar, Jacob, Moses, Gideon, Samson's mother. Angels spoke throughout the Old Testament. Spoke to Daniel, Zechariah. And we go through the whole list and we go, well, there's got to be an angelic language. No, 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 no. The languages we're talking about are to give the gospel. What good would that angelic language that you say you have be to giving anybody the gospel when you can give the gospel to them in their language and you also could edify the church by just speaking the language of your church? Verse number 8, chapter 13, very simple. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies... They shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What is the highlight there? One day this stuff is going to cease. Some say when it's the fulfillment of all scripture. Some say when it's the millennium. Some say, I, I, I said this a couple weeks ago, I just really, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, right? But what happens when you walk into, and I walk into eternity as a believer. You get quite a download, is what I understand, is that scripturally, you don't need to go in the corner and read your Bible. <laughs> so when everything is done, in terms of the time that God has for us, he says that everything will cease, and tongues will cease, and everything will cease. Because there'll be no need for any of any of this anymore. There's one thing you can't do in heaven. Who's the guy that wrote that book? Cahill? 
Mark Cahill. You can't give the gospel to someone in heaven. Not going to do any good. I think it was Mark Cahill wrote that book years ago, an evangelist and, and pastor. There's one thing you can't do in heaven. There's a long list of things you can't do in heaven anymore. Because <laughs> no one will need to be saved because it's, it's done with. And there won't be any need for tongues. Or we'll have an angelic voice. Some of you singing-wise, you will have that. I'm looking forward to that very much so. But I can't find any scripture there, so I'm going to leave that alone. Bob, are you going to come do a special for us before we finish out? No. Not your angelic voice today. Last one. Here we go. Are we all done? Here we go. We're back to 1 Corinthians 14. I told you, we're going to go out, take a walk around the neighborhood, and come back. We finish with 12, 13, and 14. Number seven says this, better is the gift of prophecy than tongues. Why? Because it edifies us. Again, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ today, then the message for you is to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus came, lived a perfect life. His blood, when he was shed, was perfect. That blood, when it was shed on Calvary's cross, washed away all sin. Cross, death, burial, resurrection, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, which, by the way, Resurrection Sunday is in two weeks. Where are we going to be at in our study? 1 Corinthians 15. I did not plan that, but I'm trying to work it now. No, just... But think of that. That's the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's a gospel. It's better, though, that the gift of prophecy is with you than tongues. Why? You could speak in tongues to give the gospel to people, but he's talking about edification. He's saying, I want the church to be built up. I want you believers to build up. Because if you're built up, then you're going to go take care of the other half. If you're not built up and you're tor torn down and you're just you're in agony and, you, and you're not edified and you're not exhorted and you don't have this sense of, gosh, I can walk with Jesus today. I need him to build me up. Please, God, the word of God, your will, Holy Spirit, I just need you to build me up. When we're built up and edified like right now with the music and the singing and the weekend for the girls and the, the praising and the speaking and the teaching and all that you had. You had a Bible lesson and investors. If you're not built up now, but that's the prophecy of the word of God being spoken to you by people. The children right now are learning that stuff in the children's ministry. And they're saying, what is it? Verse number one, two, three, four, and five, and I'll pray. I'm going to read them again. For after follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Verse 3, chapter 14. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and to exhortation and to comfort. As I read earlier, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. I don't want that. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye spake, excuse me, that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edification. Oh, you know why you're charged up when you leave the gathering? It's because the Holy Spirit and the word came together with the people of God came together. You witnessed some baptisms. There's some shouting and some screaming and some singing. You're going, this is all for his glory. This is all for his glory. This is all for your edification. It's all to build you up. To build you up. To build you up. To go out and take the language of your voice and tongue and tell somebody. Jesus Christ will save your soul. May we take some time to pray. The screen says this. We view the Holy Spirit gifts properly 
in this church, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for all of you and the people that teach the Word of God, from the ministry leaders to the deacons to everyone that teaches. Well, let's regard our privilege to pray to the Father as the great gift for all. What a gift. Why don't you bow your heads for a word of prayer? I'm going to pray for you, pray over you. Music's going to be playing in the background now. And I, I'm just going to give it to you guys and all of us together and take advantage for a couple of minutes to be in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for our time in the word. Thank you for all the beautiful stuff we've been be par partaking of, been partakers of today. You've spoken to us through your word. You've spoken to us through testimonies, through singing, through people proclaiming your goodness, your greatness, your glory, your love. Oh, thank you. So now we just want to give it back to you. This is a time of giving you what you deserve. We need to acknowledge you, extol you, and honor you. So God, I pray you do that. Push us there. And then, for your people, may we respond. In Jesus' name.